against you, brother. Shall we pray while you remain standing just a moment? Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight that the Lord Jesus has made it possible for us to assemble together again, realizing that this may be our last time this side of eternity. And we thank thee that thou hast given us this opportunity. We pray that your blessings will shatter us tonight and lay the blessings upon us just like the showers falling from heaven. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings, all of the things that we did that's wrong, even our wrong thoughts. We pray that you'll forgive us and our motives, that they're not just according to thy word and thy will. Forgive us, Lord, and let us act only in thy will. Grant a great service tonight, Father. We pray that there will not be a feeble person among us when this service is closed tonight. May everyone look to Calvary and receive their redemptive blessings that Jesus purchased there for us in the cross. We pray that you will grant this. Bless all the ministers. Give them a great encouragement, Lord, the shepherds that's over the flocks. And we pray that you will grant these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. The Lord be merciful to each of you tonight as we assemble to serve the Lord Jesus. I was told that the Christian businessman's breakfast is tomorrow morning. I wonder if Mr. Argenbrandt has arrived yet. If he's in the building, uh, anyone know that if Mr. Argenbrandt is here. Uh, I was looking for him or Mr. Moore for in the morning, the reason I asked that. Now, I'm... So sorry we have such a little short stay this time was just merely to become acquainted with each other and expecting someday to visit the Carolinas in a tent service. Uh, the Lord has given me a, a vision of having a tent. And always my services last anywhere from about, oh, perhaps from three nights up to five, ten nights at the most. I like to stay for four, five, six weeks where so we could just really have a, and have a thank you. And, and that way we could get uh, uh, set it up a year ahead so you get all the ministers not having revivals. And I, I like a real good feeling among ministers. I, I, I just love that because being a, a shepherd myself, I, I know what it means. And then maybe some brother come to town that if we set a revival and you, you've already got the evangelists coming and things, you know, kind of, you, you'd like to have it so you could go, but you're just under obligation to your word. So I hope in my coming meetings that someone will come ahead and, and set the meeting all up many, many months ahead so all the brethren can be together and we can have great fellowship one with another and have not only the night service, but have an afternoon Bible class of teaching. I, I just love that. And then we'll try then to also have our service on Sunday afternoon so that each person can go back to their churches for that evening. And then so the converts can have a place to go and the pastors at the platform to represent the different churches and denominations. We're just looking forward for a great time in the Lord. And with your prayers, I'm sure that we'll do the best we can for the glory of God. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes death to life. Prayer changes sickness to health. Changes sinners to saints. It's prayer. You may laugh too much. You may shout too much. You may eat too much, but you'll never pray too much. <laughs> the, the Bible said, I would that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. So you'll never be uh, able to pray too much. Now, I was noticing here Brother Osborne's book, the Evangelist T.L. Osborne. He is another bosom friend of mine, along with Brother Roberts and many of the other outstanding ministers of the day. I've had privilege of meeting many of them. Brother Jack Cole, I know you all heard of him. He just had a little trouble down in Florida. Brother Jack Cole's a wonderful person. He certainly is. And... Uh, uh, I remember Brother Cole, first time he came to my meeting, talk about a little skeptic, he was. And little old skinny fellow, but he sure I grilled that now. And so he, he'd come to the meeting and, oh, he would just go to tear it apart. So 
he, he tells it in his, one of his stories, I was reading some of his literature, where he, he went outside and he said, now that thing of telling people what's wrong with them things, I don't believe that. So a lady was passing by, you know, said, tell me what's wrong with her. I said, what are you so skeptic about? And I told him what the lady had there is a large children. He said, well, that's the truth. So the next night coming down to a place, I believe it was down in um, San Antonio, Texas, and we were going out to this side of the auditorium, and here stood this little old boy standing out there again, head back, and he said, I want to speak to you a minute. And I said, look, sir, why are you so skeptic? Why are you following me around like that boy? I said, now, it's going to come to pass that you're going to have a ministry similar to this, so what are you fighting about? And that's just what happened. I remember O.L. Jaggers, the hardest person I ever had to shake away from me was O.L. Jaggers. I didn't want to shake him away from me, but he was so skeptic. Oh, my, he was beating it down. And all the time, I knew he believed it in his heart, but he just wanted to see what I was doing. So he, Brother O.L. Jaggers is a bosom friend, a very fine man. And Tommy Osborne, he was there, you reading the life story. How many has read the book of my life story? Just, we have just a few of them. I don't sell books. I'm not a book salesman. <laughs> These books are not mine. Someone wrote them, and I buy them at 40 cents less than what I sell them here at, and I have to haul them and everything. I, there's money I lose on them, and I give the ushers and so forth orders. If some poor brother or sister comes by and wants one, hasn't got the money to pay for it, give it to him anyhow. See? And so something will take place. It's always come out some way. It still will. The thing is to get the message to the people. Sure, the good it does. Today, I was, last night, rather, uh, I was handed a letter. The woman may be here tonight. At this last meeting down here, and of course, I don't know what goes on when that visions are. It's another world, friends. And only way I know, see, I've got a boy sitting here with a tape recorder. And if anybody you have to watch now what it tells you, the vision doesn't heal you, but when you hear it, move out and tell you what the future is and say, Thus saith the Lord, and you mark that right down. Find out that isn't just right. It'll never fail. And, and so then that's how we keep these recordings. We know just exactly what everything was said. And you check them and double check them, and there never has been one time what everything happened just that way. It always will because it's God. See? And I remember Mr. Osborne came in at, uh, I believe it was up in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. There was about 6,500 people inside and pretty near that many outside. I was the only one on the field in that day, and there was always a lot of tinsel on the meetings, you know, you know what I mean. So I remember, I believe he and his wife, how his story goes, he was setting up, and there was a maniac ran from the platform and run up on there, and about 300 ministers shrunk back, and the man weighed about 270. I've never seen such a giant, great, big, brawny arms, and he run to the platform, and I was speaking on faith. And in them days, I weighed 128 pounds. And I was looking out over the audience, and this man ran up the platform. I seen him coming down the aisle just a snorting real loud and swinging his arms. And well, I thought it maybe it's somebody hurrying to do something. I never thought nothing about it. And all the ministers began to run backwards. And in a few minutes, this fellow ran to the platform, and he put his hands on his hips, and he said, You snake in the grass. And I looked around and I thought, well, poor fellow, there's something wrong with him. And you could tell he was, there was something wrong. He's out of an insane institution. Little did I know that the police was after him. He just broke a preacher's jawbone and collar that day. He had a mania for hurting preachers. And he's just out of an insane institution. And so they warned after him. And he hit a preacher standing on the street holding a street meeting and broke his collarbone and his jaw and got away. And just as right, two little police that I'd met in the dressing room, and they led them both to Christ. One of their mothers was healed the night before in the meeting, and both those fine little officers bowed their head there on their knees and, and surrendered their lives to Christ. Finest little fellows. I heard from one of them not long ago, both of them still holding on to God. They got acquainted with my friend, Captain Al Farrar, there's the FBI, that was one of my other converts, too, that come in and led him to Christ down in a shooting gallery <laughs> in the place. So then, um, this, um, this little fellow's run out on the platform to grab him, and I seen that this wasn't a flesh and blood affair. So I said, this isn't flesh and blood, brother. And the nicest little fellow just stepped back. He started walking up to me real slow with his hands out like this. 
and he, you could hear a pin drop anywhere. It's so quiet. He said, you low-down hypocrite, said, you snake in the grass, up here and posing yourself as a man of God. He said, tonight I'll break every bone in that measly little frame of yours, said, I'll knock you way out into the middle of the audience like that. He was plenty able to take care of his boats, and he, uh, uh, I'd look up to see the man, he was so big. Now, and he come with his teeth set together like that, and he would, his fist clenched. He started walking up towards me. Well, you better know what you're talking about. That's right. You're not fooling with flesh and blood now. Uh, the Lord sent me. Uh, the thing of it is, it's not me. It has to be him. If he sent, then he'll take care of what he sent. So I said, what's the matter? He, he said, don't talk to me. He drew back and said, that I'll break every bone in your body. And when I looked at the man, I heard myself talking. <laughs> I don't know where you know, it may sound crazy, but it was the Holy Spirit speaking. The Bible said, take no thought what you shall say. It will be added then. And it said, because that you have defied the Spirit of God, tonight you will fall over my feet. He said, boy, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over. And he drew his great big arm back and started to hit me like that. And I said, Satan, come out of the man. It's about like that. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And he had his arm back like that to strike, and he started going, ooh, ooh, and his eyes rolled back. He started going around and around like that and fell down until he just laid across my feet, and I couldn't move anyway. So they both have made a challenge. The Spirit of God and the Spirit is in him. Both of them made a challenge. So then something had to happen. The audience was waiting, and it fell. And the policeman said, is that man dead? I said, no, sir. But is he healed? I said, no, sir. He worships that spirit. He won't give it up. See? But would you move him off of my feet? I, so when they got over there, I just turned around to the audience. I said, as I was saying, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And a man sitting in a wheelchair just raised up. And the lady on the stretcher. And there was no work. Everything in there was healed right there. And they just packed him away. And the next morning, this great big truck going down the street, people singing, Only Believe, walking behind this big truck full of stretchers and wheelchairs and everything. What was it? The chief of that tribe of demons had made the challenge and lost it, you see. And that's when the Spirit of God struck the building and everything was healed. Tommy Osborne was sitting up in the balcony to see that. He went home and nailed himself in a room for three days and prayed. About... Two months after that, I was sitting at the porch one day, and a little fellow had come up, if you ever know Brother Osborne, and he's a fine little fellow, so nervous, he couldn't stand still going around his car, him and his wife. He said, Brother Branham, said, I've seen that. He said, oh, I'm a pastor of a little church. He said, but I, I believe that God is moving. And I said, yes, sir, he is. He said, do you think I have a gift of healing? I said, I'd forget it, Brother Osborne. I said, there'd be so much fanaticism packed to that after a while to... Everything that goes out has to have a gift of healing. I said, look, you're a minister, aren't you? Oh, yes. God called me to be a minister. I said, that's all right. Every minister that's called is called to pray for the sick, too. Every minister. And I said, I'd, what I do is set up there under that old oak tree and learn all the techniques of divine healing by the Word. And he said, what old oak tree? I said, that one that's bald-headed up there on the porch. Old Dr. F.F. F. Bosworth. I believe he knows more about spiritual <laughs> basis of divine healing than any man I know of in my life. He went with Brother, uh, Brother Bosworth for about two years. And when I was making my first trip to Africa, I suppose it's been about four years ago, he was, I was at that big arena there in New York where they wrestle at, and the place was packed out, and they had movie cameras set in their headlights and everything down. I was coming behind the stage. And they started saying, only believe. And I looked standing over behind the stage, and there stood little Osborne standing there. He see me. He started crying. I went over and put my arms around him. I said, well, bless your little heart. You just cry like a baby. He said, Brother Bram, I flew up here to tell you goodbye. I know you're leaving in the morning. I said, well, so glad. I said, Brother Osborne, I've heard of your great work for the Lord. I said, out in the islands and what all he's done. I said, I guess you're just wore out. He said, me wore out? He said, I ain't done nothing to be wore out about. He said, I... I don't have any discernment and have to go through all that punishment. I said, you know what? I said, I'll just stand there and take the word and tie Satan in such a knot till he just can't get out of it and then pray for the people and stand back and rejoice while we're all testifying to the hundreds. He said, well, I said, well, that's wonderful. I wish I could do that. 
He said, Brother Branham, he said, I'm glad I sat under that old oak tree. I said, do you know it's still sitting out there? I said, he's going into Africa with me. Brother Bob's brother right there at the time. Oh, such a lovely brother. Brother Tommy Osborne. And I'm sure you're reading his little book. It's the first time I ever had the privilege to say a word about his book. I just happened to see it laying here. You'll certainly enjoy it and everything because he's a scholar, diplomat, Christian brother. Oh, yes, he's just a fine fellow. And now, the Lord be merciful to us as we study his word together. I was thinking tonight, <clears throat> on instead of, how many was here last night? Let's see your hands. Oh, that's fine. All right. You could help somebody else if you hear someone criticizing in the meeting of the tactics of how the meeting operates through the Holy Spirit. And I thought tonight I would talk on faith for a little while, just build up on Christian faith. I find out that one of the greatest hindrances that the church has got today is that they're scared to death. <laughs> and what are you scared about? That's what I'm wondering. If you would just only realize that who you are... You don't know who you are. You don't know who that is sitting next to you. Or you say, yeah, that's my neighbor. I know I know him all right, but he's the son of God. <laughs> See? That's right. Adopted by Jesus Christ into the family. That's a daughter of God sitting next to you. And who are you? If you're a Christian believer, you're a son or daughter of God. What you scared about? No need of being scared. So that, as long as the devil can keep you scared, that's all he wants to do. He's got you right then. Amen. When Jesus rose, said, Fear not, I am he that was dead and alive forevermore, and had the keys of death and hell. That's right. Now, I want to read a text here tonight out of the Bible, if the Lord willing, and we'll talk just a little while on it, and start the prayer line, praying for the sick. And I believe there's a ministerial breakfast, no, it's a Christian businessman's breakfast in the morning, and I think the... They know where it's at, if we perhaps have already announced it. In the book of Genesis, we wish to read some of God's Word. In the 22nd chapter of Genesis, and beginning with the 7th and 8th verse, and then the 14th verse, inclusive, we read this. And Isaac spake unto his father, Abraham, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they both went together. Fourteenth verse. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, may he add his word, his blessings to his word, the reading of his word. The reason I like to read his word is because I know that you're going to get something by coming here if you only receive that word. For my word will fail and every other man's word will fail, but God's word cannot fail. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now... We'll have to go back a little while tonight to get the, the context of this the text. Jehovah Jireh, God appeared to mankind in seven compound redemptive names. And in those redemptive names, he represented himself to the human race for everything that we have need of while we're in this journey and in our fallen state from glory. He appeared in these redemptive names as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Jehovah thy banner. And Jehovah, uh, uh, seven different compound redemptive names that he appeared in. Now, speaking maybe tonight on this redemptive name, tomorrow night we may take Jehovah Jireh. And now they're inseparable. What he appeared as God to the human race in the beginning, he has to continue on under those names and under that provision. If he didn't, he certainly told something was wrong when he appeared to the human race and said that's what he was. And look what you'd make God then, just a man. You'd make him a liar. And if the redemptive names did not apply to Jesus, then he isn't the Savior. 
And if all these redemptive names was in Jesus, well, then he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so there's no way out of it. And you have, can't, they're inseparable. If Jehovah appeared as Jehovah that, that will provide the sacrifice, then he appeared Jehovah that will heal, Jehovah that is our banner, Jehovah that is our shield, Jehovah that is our strength, Jehovah is our praise, and all these different names that he appeared in, he has to remain that because he introduced himself to the human race by those names. You see it? Now, this old man and his young son standing up on the mount, ready to be offered a very beautiful type of Christ and God. Isaac was a type of Christ. Now to get something about his life, let's go back at the beginning and find out how, what pictured this up here on the hill. We'll get the context to get to our text. And we go back and find out that God called Abraham by, in the Genesis, the 12th chapter, by sovereign grace he called Abraham. Not because Abraham was any better than anyone else, but because God, by foreknowledge and election, called Abraham, and that's the way he called you. The Bible said so. Notice, not because Abraham was good, he come from his father, which means delay, and they come down from Babylon, perhaps idolaters, from Nimrod who first built uh, Babylon and caused it to be a confederation and all the people had to flock into it. it a, a Babylon appears in the beginning, it appears in the middle of the Bible, and it appears in the last of the Bible. And everything that we got here today began in Genesis. Genesis is the seed book or the crop book where God planted first and Satan planted terriers. And it all comes down as vines growing up. And today we're at the harvest time of the whole thing. But every cult that we got on earth today with time and historians like Hossus II, Babylon's, Josephus, and many of the early writers, we could go back there and prove every cult with every action that has got began in Genesis. And the Church of the Living God began in Genesis. So the vines are growing right up. But by their fruits, you know what they are, but what they produce. Maybe. Lord willing, I'll speak on it one night before we leave. The true and false vine. Notice, then Abraham called by election and God giving him the covenant of grace unconditionally. You know, when God makes a covenant with man, man breaks his covenant. You make a promise to God, nine times out of ten you'll, you'll not do it. When God made a covenant with man in the Garden of Eden, this you do, and if you do this, there's an if in it. Man turned right back around it and broke his covenant with God. God was determined to save man. So instead of saying if, he was no if to Abraham, I have. You see the assurance? You'll come to me in an old age. I've already settled it. Not if you do anything, I've already done it. Then it's got to be sure. Now, not Abraham, if you backslide, or Abraham, if you'll keep my word, Abraham, if you'll do this or you'll do that, God said, I have already done it. Oh, you said, I'd like to be Abraham. Oh, Brother Branham, if I had that assurance, then I would certainly rest perfectly quiet. Well, you've got the same assurance and the same covenant. The covenant was not only to Abraham only, but to his seed after him. Amen. If you begin to see that, then divine healing becomes easy. Any other promise that God has given becomes easy when you see that it's not you, it's God. God has given the promise. So then you don't get restless. 
As I said, here, John, I believe it's Spindale or somewhere, maybe Columbia, or it's one of the meetings along here in Carolina, just before I got here. So I woke up one night with the best sermon on my heart, and I didn't have no one to preach to, so I just woke my wife up and preached to her, and she went to sleep. <laughs> and I, I was preaching to her on the Christian's rest. When you come to Christ, everything's settled. Come unto me, all you that labor, labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. It's settled. It's all over. Christ has done paid the price. Everything you have to do is just rest. Let down. Quit jumping around, getting all disturbed. Place to place and denomination, packing your letter from the Methodist to the Baptist. Put it in heaven once and leave it there. Amen. Don't be disturbed. Let God... Just come to him and rest. If he Jehovah Jireh, rest on him. If he Jehovah Rapha, rest on him. If he's the Lord that saves us by grace, rest on him. If he's the Lord who heals us by grace, rest on him. If he's the God that's coming from heaven with ten thousands of his saints, rest on him. If the dead in Christ shall rise first, rest on him. Everything. Rest. Oh, my. I feel pretty religious right now. Oh, resting. Not jumping about from pillar of post and carry about with every wind of doctrine, but resting on what God said. Every promise in the book is yours. Every amen and yea is yours. What you got to be worried about? Even old age, it shouldn't have a thing to do with it. Sickness has nothing to do with it. God promised. And God has to keep His promise. See, what we're trying to do is get the scare away from you. Or you say, I'm afraid the neighbors. Well, then you ought to come to Christ. You wouldn't go to your neighbor then. Amen. All right, but I'm talking about those that are in Christ. Don't care what anybody else says, it's what he said. A Christian doesn't look to the things of the world. They don't look at what they see. They look at what they don't see, but what they believe. The Christian looks at the unseen. So we don't see what we believe. If it is, it is no more faith. But faith is what you do not see and believe. Because you believe the one that give the promise is true to his promise. So Abraham. A man, 75 years old, married to his half-sister, Sarah, and they came down from the land from Chaldea to the city of Ura and dwelt in the Shanghai Valleys, perhaps lived a good long lives of people then. They'd go out in the morning and get some berries out of the bushes and eat them, and then along noontime go out and kill an animal with their bow or, or spear and have their proteins and so forth and a few berries and go to bed at night, lived a good normal life. But this man, not because he was different, but because God, oh, I just love to push it down, see, because God saw grace in the heart of Abraham and saved him by election. Give him the promise. You haven't chose me, said Jesus. I chose you. People said, I just tall and wrestled, seeking God. Oh, no. It was God seeking you. You just wouldn't turn loose. No man seeks God. No man has sought God at any time. But, but man is a coward. He runs from God, but God seeks man. Started in the Garden of Eden. Adam running, hiding behind the bushes. God out running up and down the garden. Then Adam, Adam, where art thou? Father seeking his lost child, not the lost child seeking the father. Same today. How we could dwell on that a while, if time would permit. But notice. God called Abraham and gave him this promise, this covenant. Not if you will, but I have, and not only to Abraham only, but to his seed after him. And you say, well, I wish I was a Jew. 
Maybe I would be of the seed of Abraham. Paul said that which is of the seed natural is not a Jew. But look, are we Jews, the seed of Abraham? Yes. Is Abraham's seed still being called? Yes. The Bible said, we which are dead in Christ take on Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. So every man that has died to himself and been born anew in the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus and take on Abraham's seed and got the same spirit that let Abraham leave his seed. Amen. Excuse me for slobbering. I've been eating some of these grapes over here in Canaan and it makes me slobber a whole lot sometimes. Watch! Abraham, chose of God by grace, are you saved? And that not by works, lest any man should boast. Is that right? That's the scripture. Just as clear as the old black bag Bible teaches it. Yes, sir, by grace are you saved. God calls you. No man can come to me except the Father draws him first. And all the Father has given me will come to me. Amen. Amen. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood, worthily that is, hath everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Amen. Amen. Those who he has called, he has justified, and those who he has justified, he hath past tense already glorified. Amen. And tonight we're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus. What you scared about? God promised these things in the last days, and we're seeing them. Wake up! The time of visitation is at hand. From the Lord, the refreshing that He promised that both former and latter rain both would be poured out in the last day. Remember, the prophet said it'll be a day that won't be neither night or day. Night or daylight. It'll be a misty day. It's been that way for 2,000 years. But the same Holy Spirit that brought light to the early Eastern people, geographically, civilization travels westward. We're at the West Coast. East and west is joined together. But the prophet said, in the evening it shall be light. We've had enough light to know that Jesus was the Son of God to come in and join churches and start organizations and things. But the old time Pentecostal power that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, our teachers has told us that's all of it. That said it. That was all. Is God righteous or unrighteous? God true or untrue? The prophet said it will be light in the evening time. All the mist will fall away, and the same sun that shined on the eastern people will shine on the western people in an old time Holy Ghost revival. Just exactly what the prophet said. Amen. Glory be to God. And this is that. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, This is that. And, brethren, I don't say this for a joke, but if this ain't that, I'm going to keep this till that comes. Amen. Praise the Lord. It'll be light. Abraham's seed journey on to the west. But now the same sun that raised in the east on the Jews is setting in the west on the Gentiles with the same signs and wonders, the same Holy Ghost. Every word of God is true. Maybe you, you just ask God and he'll put it together for you, you see. It's just like a big jigsaw puzzle. I don't mean to compare the Bible with that. By no means, it's the Holy Word of God. But you take a jigsaw puzzle and if you don't watch, you get your scenery all mixed up. Cow picking grass on the top of a tree. So it ain't right. So you got to get it right. And God is the same. And you get the Bible together and you find us one great big beautiful picture of redemption. God dealing with his people. Now could you imagine Sarah and Abraham? Abraham going in and saying, Sarah, honey, you know what happened? I was just talking to God. He showed me something. Yes, we're going to have a baby. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yes, Abraham, 75, Sarah, 65, going to have a baby, married her when she was about 17, and you're there all, in about 27, lived with her all these years, she was perfectly barren, and now at the age of 65, about 20 years of past menopause, God said, you're going to have a baby. Could you imagine it? Could you imagine? He said, buy up all the bird eye and the pins and get ready, we're going to have it. The impossible. But the Bible said that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. 
but was strong, giving praise to God, and called those things which were not as though they were. Are you Abraham's seed tonight? Amen. Be honest. If God promised divine healing to Christ Jesus, and he was Jehovah Jireh, what are we staggering about? Amen. You're Abraham's seed. You don't stagger. You believe it. Amen. Now, if you're not born again, then I don't know about that. You might be tossed about with anything. But if your heart's really fixed on Christ and been born again, you believe every word he said to be the truth. No matter how much theology somebody tries to scatter it away and push it to one side, put it another day, if God's promise is true to there, he's true here. Amen. He promised it to be the same yesterday, day, and forever, and he is. Amen. And why is he doing it for some and not for others? Because some's believing and others are not. Amen. It's the only thing can be. Now we're going to know that God is true. Now, watch this. Abraham had Sarah to get all the things ready to have the baby. He didn't know when it was going to come. God don't tell you just when your healing is going to come, but he promised to give it to you. <laughs> See? He said, now, Abraham said, now, when, when are we going to get this baby? Now, that's none of your business. You go on. I told you. That's all you have to do. Lord, I promised it, and I'm good as my word. Well, Abraham said, hallelujah, I believe it. And away he goes. Go around telling everybody he's going to have a baby, him and Sarah. Him 75 and her 65. Could you imagine it? Why walk up to a doctor today? Old man, take his 65-year-old wife in and say, Well, doc, I want to make arrangements for the hospital. <laughs> well, you know, they'd think he was crazy. And any man that'll take God at his word is considered crazy to the world. It's foolishness to the world. But notice, Sarah... Believed it too with Abraham. And then they said, separate yourself. Oh, there's the time. That's what's so contrary to the world today. You know, the people want good mixers. When you call for your new pastor at the conference, you vote for some little jelly bean, excuse that expression, but some little fellow that's a mixer. Oh, he's kind of, he goes out... He takes swimming kids, all the kids out swimming, and, and oh, he has sociable parties, and we have some dinners in the basement, and, and we, he always lets out early, don't speak over 20 minutes so we can see the new Molly Dolly on the television and so forth like that. That's the kind you want. That's right. You want mixers, but God calls for separators. Amen. The Holy Ghost called for Paul and Barnabas to be separated. Oh, yes. You want some fella that looks like a Hollywood movie star with locks like a girl and act the same way? You know, a lot of people look for those kind of people. Collar turned around, a frock tail coat on a carnation, and oh, you know what I mean. I went to hear a preacher here not long ago, and he changed suits twice while he was preaching. God, oh my. Look, friend. I'm just old-fashioned enough not to believe in this Hollywood revivalism going around today. I like the old-fashioned backwoods, sky blue, shame-filling religion that don't whitewash the flesh is white. Makes them in clean. That's right. We need back to the good old St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost again. Not a supper room, but an upper room. That's right. Back to the Bible. You know, man chooses after the eye. God chooses the heart. One time there was a man going to be anointed for king to take Saul's place. The prophet went up with a, a big gourd full of oil to anoint one of Jesse's children. Jess being a man, he said, sure, I got the boy to loot. He's seven foot tall. Bring him out. How nice he looked at that crown sitting on his head, his priestly robes and things around him. Oh, he'll make a real king for Israel. Brought him out and the prophet said, all right, I'll anoint him. Here he runs. God said, I've refused him. He said, well, I got one that's a little bit shorter than he is. Perhaps he'll be the one always straight-shouldered and how he is. That he's the one that I'll bring him out. The prophet said, I'll anoint him. God said, I've refused him. He went on and he got six of them out. So God said, I refused every one of them. He said, have you got another one? He said, yes, a little old skinny, scrawny thing back down the herd of the sheep. He said, go get him. He said, my, surely God wouldn't make something like that. 
But he said, I chose him. Pour the oil on him. Amen. God looks at the heart. Amen. Amen. Notice, Sarah got ready. They got everything ready and took a journey, separated themselves, called out. They were the church of the living God at that time. Church means called out, the ones that's called out. And they sojourned as pilgrims and strangers, professing that they were pilgrims and strangers and was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. Not knowing where they were going, but by faith they went. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, I just love his word. These old nuggets, I like to, be, I'm a prospector. I like to dig down and get the nuggets and polish them up and hang them out there. Every one you find will point to Calvary. Yes. And here they go. This old man and his wife, nephew, starting out across the country to be pilgrims and strangers. And as he went along, God met him and said, Now, Abraham, I'm going to make your seed like the dust of the earth. The first month passed. Sarah, dear, is it, is it all right? Nope. No different. Oh, there isn't? No. Second month passed. Sarah, what about it, dear? No different, Abraham. Hallelujah. We're going to have it anyhow. Six months passed. Sarah, you feel any different? No different at all. Glory, we're going to have it anyhow. <laughs> Why? God said so. That settles it. A year passed. Sarah, how are you feeling now? No different. Hallelujah, we're going to have it anyhow. The Bible said instead of him getting weaker like we do, he got stronger. Because it was more of a miracle when she was 66 than it would be when she was 65. And she never had the baby until she was 100. Glory! He kept everything laying aside because he knew it was coming, rejoicing, looking for the day that God would fulfill his promise. And got stronger all the time. Oh, if we are prayed for and the next day we don't feel just exactly right. Well, I'm Abraham's seed, but I, I, I just missed it, I guess. Oh, you poor excuse. <laughs> Abraham's seed believes God. Takes God at his promise and calls those things which are not as though they were. Amen. Notice, it went on. God appeared to him. And he told him all what he was going to do. And after a while, Abraham began to get older. He got around about 90. And he said, now, what about this, Lord? Am I, am I going to have the baby right away? Now, Abraham, what are you questioning me about? Now, I told you he's going to have the baby. That settles it. All right, Lord, would you just let me look over the curtain once? <laughs> I like to know how you're going to do it. <laughs> you know, Lord, I'm not doubting your word, but I, I, I like to look over the curtain. Brother, how we all like to look over the curtain. You ever hear that song, I want to look past the curtain of time? Everybody wants to look over the curtain. You know, God's so good to us. He said, then come here, Abraham. I'll just let you peep over the curtain. I'll show you how I'm going to do it. So he took him out there one afternoon. He said, now I want you to go get me a she-goat, three years old. I want you to get me a heifer of three years old. I want you to get me a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And Abraham went out and got them. Wish we had time to go in what, them, what they represented. But you notice, he cut the goat in two, he cut the heifer in two, and he cut the ram in two, but the turtle dove and the young pigeon he never divided. 16th chapter of Genesis. He never divided those. Why? The turtle dove and the pigeon represented divine healing. The dispensations of grace was changed. That's true between law and grace and so forth. But healing always remained the same under every covenant, under every condition. Right. So he said, cut them, and he cut them in two, and he laid one against the other. And now he said, Abraham... I want to show you, my child, just 90, I want to show you just how I'm going to do this now. Now Abraham said, I want to see, Lord. Now the first thing the Bible says, that God caused a deep sleep to come up on Abraham. A deep sleep. Abraham, I'm going to show you that you ain't got nothing to do with this. I'm going to do it myself. 
the job's going to be right when he doesn't. Yes, brother, that's where I rest right there. God said so. I'm not saved tonight because I feel like it. I'm not saved by feelings. I'm saved because I believe it and met the conditions the Bible required. The devil can beat you around the stump. Tomorrow morning you may get up a headache and feel like it's a million miles away, but God's grace holds tight. Amen. Yes, Amen. sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Not what you feel, but what you believe. Yes. Jesus never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? And that's right. The difference, quite a difference. Not by feelings, but by faith. And Abraham, God took him and put him to sleep. Now showing Abraham, I'm going to take you out of the picture. There's nothing you can do about it. I, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it, Abraham. So he put Abraham asleep. And when Abraham fell asleep, he kept the birds off until the sun went down off the carcasses of the dead animals. And then when Abraham went to sleep, the first thing appeared before him was a horrible blackness. Death that comes to every man. Separation. Can't see where you're going. Death is due to every unregenerated man. Death is the first to the human race because of transgression of God's Word. And then after that, he saw a smoking, burning furnace. Every sinner deserves to go to hell. Every human being should go to hell. Right. First, death. After death, hell. That's what he promised. But notice, next, he saw a little light come up, a little light. Oh, my. This little light went up and went in between these pieces of flesh, moving back and forth between them. Abraham, being a prophet, knew what that meant. God was showing him what he was going to do at Calvary. He was letting him look over the curtain and see Calvary under through the seed of Abraham, through Isaac, would come out Christ and want the sacrifice to be paid. Now let's write it in the Oriental language so you can understand it. Today, if Brother Jeffries and I would make a covenant with one another, well, I'd take a hold of his hand, I'd say, shake on it, Brother Jeffries. That's a covenant in America. We make a covenant with one another. We shake one another's hands. Right hand of fellowship. Come on into the church, brother. That, that's a right hand. That's a covenant. In China, or Japan, rather, down there when you make a covenant, you make a covenant between one another, and then you get a little cruise of salt, and you stand and throw salt on one another. That's a covenant. In Japan. But in the Orient, in them days when you made a covenant, Here's what you did. You take an agreement and you wrote it up, whatever your agreement was. All right. And then you walked over and killed an animal. And you cut that animal in two. And you stood between these two pieces of dead flesh and you swore to each other that if you broke this covenant, let your body be as this dead animal. And you've taken this covenant and tore it apart. One man took one piece and one took another piece. And when this covenant was confirmed, when it come together, both pieces had to come exactly the same, letter by letter. And your vow was that if you didn't do it, let you become as this dead animal that died to confirm this covenant. You see it? Then what did God do? At Calvary, he took Christ Jesus, his son, and put him on the cross, and he tore him in two. He ripped the soul from the body, and he took the body up into heaven and sent back the Holy Ghost to the church, that on that day the same spirit that was up on Christ Jesus has to be in his church a dovetail one with the other on that day. And God swore by himself that he'd raise that church up, a glorious church. How can it fail? Amen. That's God's everlasting eternal covenant he swore by himself. He'll keep his promise. Amen. Amen. Oh, I hope you see it. How can you fail? I can fail more. It isn't whether I fail, it's whether he failed. 
and he didn't fail. And God confirmed it by raising him up from the dead. And today the same Holy Ghost that was upon Christ Jesus is in the church writing the same covenant that he did back there and doing the same thing that he did back there. And the church flees on him, and the unbeliever displeases him and calls him Beelzebub and devils and so forth like he did back there. There's a difference between the covenant people and the people that hasn't the covenant. Christ died to become a man. He took our sins upon himself and went there and was nailed to the cross, and his soul was rent from him and cast into hell, and God raised him up on the third day for our justification and sent the Holy Ghost back to us and the glorified body of his Son sitting on his throne in heaven. Watch what a type it is there. In Egypt, when the poor Jews were all beat, Joseph, being a, a type of Christ, Born to be a seer, he saw visions, he's hated of his brothers, loved of his father. He couldn't help because he saw visions. He was a spiritual boy. God made him that way, and the father loved him, but his brothers hated him, a type of the church today. The carnal thinking Christian hates the spiritual things, hates the phenomenal, hates the spiritual of born again, hates the, the great move of God. Hate it without a cause. That's right. Don't unchristianize them, but they hate always the natural hates the supernatural. Amen. Now watch. And he was sold for thirty pieces of silver, almost thirty pieces, like Joe's Christ was, and was thrown into a ditch, supposing to be dead, taken up and set at the right hand of the greatest city in the commercial city in the world. And when he went forth, every man bowed the knee to Joseph, and no man can come to Pharaoh except by Joseph, and no man can come by to God except the Christ, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to him. And when he was in his prison there, the butcher and the butler, one was lost and one was saved, just exactly like on the cross, one lost and one saved. And then he left his body for a memorial. He said, don't bury me. I was supposed to put my hands on that old lead casket he laid in, supposing to be in a museum in England here not long ago. But in this and his bones laid there, he said, don't take my bones out. Until you go out of here, for he believed that God would visit the people, like he said. He was Abraham's seed, so he took God at his promise. And every man, Jew with his back beaten from the cat and nine tails, and the switches and the rods of Egypt, would pass by and look at that body of Joseph and say, Someday we're going home. That's right. And today we can look at our Joseph, our empty tomb, when we bury our loved ones and say, Someday we're going home. Amen. And when we get there, we were born for this earth. We'll never be angels. God never made us angels. He made us men and women. We'll always be that. We'll have a celestial body there. It doesn't appear yet what kind of a body we'll have when we're there. But uh, we'll be able to eat and drink and sleep like I do here. But it'll be a, a, a body, but not the resurrected, glorified body. And the souls under the altar were crying, Lord, how long? And every time they were under the altar and looked up there, there was an actual glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus sitting there, representing that someday he'll move off of his throne there, coming to the earth, and everyone that's dead in Christ will come with him and receive a body like his own glorious body. You'll see him as he is. Oh, Bible ties together one big beautiful picture. Said Abraham, that's what I'm going to do, that's how I'm going to do it. And he walked out, now look, he said, Now, Abraham, number the stars of heaven, if you can. They're without number. Here some time ago, I stood in Mount Wilson, out there where you could see through this big observatory, big glass, see 120 million years of light space. Wow, well, how many nines would that take to break it down in miles? 120 million years of light space, and beyond that was still moons and stars and all and on, the great solar system. And I stood there amazed. And I said, think of it. My heavenly father just blowed him off his hand like that. Put him into a place and they obeyed him. He was big enough to do that and came little enough to save me. He became me and I to become him. Christ became a sinner that through his poverty we might receive his riches as to be sons and daughters of God. Amen. Wouldn't that make the Methodist shout almost to think of that? Sure it would. 
Think of it. It's not a fictitious story. It's not Santa Claus. It's God's eternal holy Bible. Amen. Amen. And it's just as true as we're sitting here. Notice. He said, now watch. In Genesis 13, he said, your seed is like the dust. After he gave him the promise, he's going to confirm the promise. He said, your seed is like the stars. From the dust to the stars. Oh. Do you see it? The resurrection. Amen. From the dust to the stars. Amen. From a mossy, slimy, glittery <laughs> dust to a shining star. And what's the head of the stars? The greatest, the morning star, which was Christ. Amen. The first fruits of those who slept. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at what a little 40 years has done for me. Get your old man, stooped shoulder, wrinkled face, bald headed. But oh my, the morning star hasn't lost one glitter since the day that God placed it in the sky. And the Bible said, we will outshine the star. Amen. What you scared about? God promised and swore to it by the death of Christ he would do it. And he called you by sovereign grace and elected you before the foundation of the world. Amen. Why was Christ called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world? God, in the beginning, when he saw what Satan had done, had perverted what he had made good, Satan can't create, you know. Satan is everything that Satan's got, he perverted as something that belonged to God. That's right. He perverted. And when he saw what he had done, God first began to think, oh my, that's when he saw you. That's when he saw me. Amen. Now, the Bible said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, as long, what, is, what is a Word? A Word is a thought uh, expressed. So then, as long as it was a thought, it wasn't materialized. It, it couldn't be yet. But when God once expressed it, it was as good as finished right then. Oh, my. That would make Pentecost shout. Think of it. God, before the foundation of the world, saw you. You wasn't there, but you was in his mind. He saw it. Therefore, foreknowledge he could foretell. That's the reason he likened his prophets to eagles. They go way up to see the sunlight before it ever gets there, see? Oh, my, isn't he wonderful? Don't you love him? All, all by grace, not because you deserve it, because he said so. He, 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 he called you. You never called him. He called you. Oh, what a, how could you turn it down? But think of it. There'll be a time when there, one of these days you're, when this old world is struck by the atomic power and she's laying out there turning around in space, you know, howling hot sands of the blast, when she's thrown into the sun, this time, first time it's thrown away from the sun, which calls the water, the heat to the coal, and this time it'll be thrown into the sun, and all bursted up and blowed over, and the wind will howl, and your tombstone may shine up through the sand, but you'll be somewhere. But think by the sovereign grace of God, He's given you the opportunity to come to Him. Think of it. No wonder when oceans have wept theirself in the deserts, he'll still be the loving God. Yes. When the moon and stars will fail to shine, he'll still be God. He said the heavens and the earth, the solar system, the millions of years of light space will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Please, please. When there's no more sea, no more desert, no more mountains, no more world, my word will in ever endure the same, the same, the same. The one that made the promise. Who made the promise? He did. Not only promised it, but he swore by himself because there's no other hire to swine by. He swore by himself and he'd keep it. Oh, am I, am I anchored away? Amen. <laughs> oh, hide my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Amen. Glory be to God. Glory. Go to call me a holy roller anyhow. I say, might as well get started now. Peace. Well, I think of it. As the poet said on that morning, one of these days when he returns, my, I can see Adam wake up, shake his head, 
shake Eve and say, honey, wake up, it's here. <laughs> Eve reached over, got a hold of Seth and said, Seth, come on. Seth got a hold of Noah. Noah got a hold of Abraham. Abraham got a hold of Isaac. Isaac and Jacob. Well, they just keep shaking one another. She come right on down. Oh, He's coming. Amen. I promised it. Amen. Every word. Is true. Every word, every line, every chapter, every verse. All heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. God said that. That makes it right. Yes, it is. That makes it right when He said so. I can see Abraham. Stand there looking up towards the heavens. <laughs> looking down towards the earth. <laughs> Lord, you said it. I believe it. Here he starts on. <laughs> grabs that old cane. He goes back in the hint and says, Sarah, we're going to have him anyhow. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. <laughs> Let me look up past the curtain of time. He'll confirm it. That's right. He's doing it. He does it each time. He'll do it here tonight. He's right here now. Abraham then become 90 and 9 years old. <laughs> 25 years after promises given him, still strong. Amen. Why, well, Sarah's womb was dead. Abraham was dead. His seed was dead within him. But not God's Word. <laughs> no matter how dead you are, as long as that Word's in there, his life. <laughs> Can you take it tonight? Can you receive the Word? <laughs> I'm the Lord that heals all thy diseases. Look to me all the ends of the earth and be healed. <laughs> he was wounded for our transgressions and with his stripes we were healed. See, God promises. Jesus said, The things that I do, shall you do also. I'll make myself known to every generation to the end of the world. I'll be with you even in you. The same things that I do, you'll do also. More than this, because the revival is all the way around the world yes. right now. Yes, the fire is burning on every hill. Hallelujah. It's a universal affair now. It's not only in Charlotte, it's the world over. God, save for yes. The angels together the elect from the four winds of the earth. Abraham's seed's got to come. <laughs> Amen. Oh, don't you feel real good when you're the Holy Ghost again? Please. Abraham just bathed himself in the beauty of God. I hear him say, Come here, Abraham. Genesis 17 now. And God appeared to him in the name of El Shaddai, the Almighty. El Shaddai, the, the word's a Hebrew word, which really means breast. I'm your brother now, like the woman's breast that nurses the baby. In other words, Abraham, you know how I'm going to do this? You know, you're old. You're 100 years old, and Sarah's 90. But I am the breasted one, the breasted God. Now, Abraham, I know you're old, but I'm the breasted one. Now, the only thing you do is just lean right up against my word and nurse for me all your strength like a little baby. You take a little baby when it's sick and threatened. It'll lay against its mother, and it'll nurse life from mother. And not only when it's nursing, it quits fretting. You get it? He quits fretting and he's satisfied. He just lays against his mother and starts nursing, that's all. As long as mama's got her arms around baby and he's a nursing for mama, he's pretty well satisfied. And all the time he's nursing, he's putting vitamins into him that's building him up. And a man, no matter how sick you are, how old you are, how stupid you are in sin, lean against the breast of God and go to nursing, and spiritual vitamins will have you shouting and praising God and running down the aisle. Satisfied as you can be. He's got all the calories you need. Notice, not only was he a breast, but breasted. Not one breast, but two breasts. The breasted one. The all-sufficient one, almighty one, all-powerful one. He had two breasts. One was for the healing of your soul, and the other was for the healing of your body. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Amen! Amen. Oh, I'm so glad tonight to know that I know him in the power of his resurrection by his grace. What he calls from the dead. Oh, my, way with my text. 
or getting to it, brother. We'll start there tomorrow night. Let's just leave it go. It's time for healing service. I, I didn't realize, I didn't think it was 9 o'clock yet. It's time to close up. You love him? Yes, sir. Oh, as the poet said, oh, I want to see. Look up on his face. There to sing forever. I'll be saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cures all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. How beautiful, how wonderful to rest upon his promise. Just trust him. He gave the promise, the things that I do shall you also. A little while in the world won't see me no more, yet you'll see me. For I'll be with you, in you, all where you're gathered together unto the end of the world. Amen. What a beautiful promise. Here some time ago, there's a slave buyer come through the South when they had slavery, and there was, they were spying slaves like they do cars today. And many of the slaves who'd come away from their homes, they were beaten and everything. They didn't want to work. They know they'd never go back home. The Boers brought them from Africa and sold them here for slaves. And they were disheartened, maybe mother and dad over there and the children here and separated here and there, never see one another again. They didn't work very good. They had to make them work with whips. But they'd come by and a man would kind of, in a commercial way, would come along and buy up a big bunch of slaves at a cheap price, take them over and sell them to another plantation, make some money on them, brokers. So one day there was a broker come up to a certain plantation, and I don't know why I'm telling this, but anyhow, when he come up to this plantation, he noticed all the slaves and them having a whooping, but one young man, oh, he was gallant. Chin back, out, his shoulders back, just snappy. He'd go do anything you want him to do. So the broker said to the, to the plantation owner, I'd like to buy that slave. He said, he's not for sale. He said, well, I said, what makes him that way so gallant? He said, I noticed he, yes, sir, right at the job, anytime. Head up, gallant man. So I'll give you a double price what I give for an ordinary state. He said, you couldn't buy him for five prices. He said, he's not for sale. He said, well, why? He said, uh, is he the boss or the rest of them? He said, no, sir. He said, do you feed him any different? He said, no, sir. They all eat out of a galley together. He said, they all eat the same and they all are just the same. He's just a slave. He said, what well, makes him so much different from the rest of them? He said, well, I didn't know that myself. So one day I found out that his father is the king of the tribe. And though he's away from home, he keeps himself up to keep the morale of the rest of them built up. So he knows that he's a king's son. Oh, brother. <laughs> I don't care what some of this little overnight preaching does. Brother, stick your chin up. We're sons and daughters of God. We may be alienated here, but our father is a king. Believe God. Don't matter what comes or goes, conduct yourself like sons and daughters of God. You women, wash the paint off your face, let your hair grow out again. You men, throw that cigar out of your mouth and go out here and act like sons and daughters of God. Put all this here wishy-washy dabbling around about the place and be, conduct yourself like sons and daughters of the King. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, so glad tonight to know that we're children of the Heavenly King. It does not yet appear what we shall be in the end, but we know we'll have a body like his glorious body, for we shall see him as he is, free from sickness, free from sin, free from weary, free from toils, sit down at his feet, home again, mama and papa, everybody around. Dear God, I pray tonight that you'll save the lost. Maybe some good Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterians, backslid, Pentecostal, Pilgrim Holiness, someone here who's got away from God. Oh, Father, we pray tonight you'll bring them back home. That poor lost son and daughter of God here that's never yet accepted you. You've knocked at their door. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. And you have called and called, and they won't answer. May tonight, may they give that one yes, Lord. Now I come, I believe. Upon the word of the Lord, I accept Christ as my Savior. 
while we have our heads bowed and everybody in prayer. I wonder down here on the bottom floor if there'd be someone would raise your hand. And by this say, Brother Branham, I just want God to see my hand, that I know I'm wrong and I want to be right with God. We have no way of making an altar call to bring you up around to pray. But I just like if while everybody's praying, every eye closed, if the Christians especially pray at this moment. Would you just raise your hand, send a friend, say, God, be merciful to me. Would you do it? Anyone? God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you. That's good. You might have done a lot of great things in your life, but that's the greatest thing you've ever done. Up in the balcony, on the side rows here, in the box seats, is there anyone that would raise your hand? God bless you up there, sir. I see you. Someone else? I, it's the Christ now. You're not putting your hand up to me. It's the Christ. God knows your heart. He's speaking to you. And if he's speaking, then raise your hand and say, Yes, Lord, I've been wrong. I, I was chosen to be Abraham's seed. You call me, call me. Now, I never have accepted yet, but now I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to raise up my hand and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And from this night henceforth, I'm going to try my best, God, with your help, to live a different life from tonight on. Would one more put up their hand anywhere that has not put up their hand yet? See, you say, Brother Bram, what does that mean to put up their hand? Jesus said these words solemnly. Let me repeat it to you. First, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that my Father's given me will come to me. What if you were predestinated or predestined by foreknowledge to never receive Christ? You know, that's so. The Bible said that man of old was foreordained to this condemnation to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Jude, the fourth verse. Yes, what if that was you, that God never did speak to your heart? What if that was you, sinner, and when you go out of this church tonight, walking down the street, down there, drop over dead? What if you call the doctor, he comes and says, well, there's nothing to do, mother or dad, whoever it is, they're gone. God bless you, sir. That's, I'm not frightening you. I'm only stating facts. I don't know what you're going, you're going to do that sometime. So he may never, my spirit will not always strive with man. So why not just now lift your hand? Say, will he save me if I do that? He promised to. Listen to me quote scripture now. St. John 5, 24. Think of a handful and two dozen of eggs. Read it when you get home. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, right now, present tense, eternal life and shall never come into judgment but pass from death to life. What does it mean to raise your hand with a true heart behind it? It means you're passing death to life. He that heareth my words, and friend, I, as clear as I know how to type it tonight, I brought it to you. Uh, I don't know, it might not have been just polished up, but you know, it, it's truth anyhow. It's from the Word. And you heard it and you believe it, and believe on Christ and raise your hand and say, I believe that story. God's obligated to take you. God bless you. That's right. Someone else, just before closing, would you do it? See, I'm trying to find all the grace with God. That I see your hand, sir. You are weeping there with your hand up. God bless you. You pass from death to life. When you put your hand up, sonny boy, that you pass right out of death to life. That's what God said. His words can't fail. All the stars will fail. All the earth will fail. But his word won't. And none other said it but Jehovah in flesh. Emmanuel, he that heareth my words, believeth on him and sent me, hath right now everlasting life, shall never perish or even come to the judgment, but's already passed from death to life. Just feel constrained to say once more, for closing, just feel that there's one more here somehow. Don't hope you don't pass me a fanatic. But who is that that's holding back just now, that's pressing my heart so? That would just raise your hand and say, it's me, Brother Branham. I want to receive Christ just now as my Savior. God bless you, lady. That's fine. The Lord be gracious to you. Now, Heavenly Father, knowing that thy word is true, feeling the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, you're now tugging at my heart, knowing in a few moments God must be glorified or the black flags of hell would rage. Now, the angels have triumphed. Souls has come to the Christ. Father, thou knowest our hearts. All these that raise their hands are now as 
acting as a priest between the living and dead, I now command them unto thee, Lord, and commit them to thee, and ask that in thy holy name, the Lord Jesus, that you will confirm your promise to each one, and now give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. For thou hast said, He that heareth my word, breatheth on him, and sent me, hath right now everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for them. May they be baptized with the Holy Ghost into the church now, the church of the firstborn, become members of some good group somewhere, full gospel preaching somewhere. Grant it, Father. We'll see them at the day of the judgment, if not before. Now let thy mercy and grace rest upon us all. Through Jesus, thy holy child, we ask that. Amen. I just love that song. Only believe. How many knows who wrote it? My buddy, Paul Rayer, Baptist preacher. Hey, I didn't say he was Baptist. He is kind of like I am. <laughs> kind of a little Calvinist. You know, did you hear his last words when he's dying in California? He and Luke stayed together, like my boy and I stayed together, his brother. Luke just died recently. Paul got out there and he got him all tied up to a big bunch of formal religions and things, and he was a gospel preacher. He was dying, laying in the hospital, and he said, where's Luke? First Moody Bible sent down the little quartet there to sing for him. He had the sh curtains all down at the windows, and they, he said, who's dying near you? He said, raise up them curtains and sing me some snappy gospel songs. He had a kind of sense of humor. They begin to sing, Down at the cross where my Savior died. He said, That sounds better. So where's Luke? Luke couldn't stand to see his brother die. He's over in the other room. He said, Tell him, come here. Come over, took a hold of Luke's hand, looked up at him. He said, Luke, think of it. In five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Squeezed his brother's hands and went to meet God. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. Partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time, footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main for a full on and shipwrecked brother has seen shall take heart again. That's right. Oh, I'm so happy tonight souls came to Christ. Now we have a little prayer line. Or did the boy, did you give out prayer cards? Does prayer cards give out? Yeah, all right. Oh, yes, give a hundred of them out last night. What was that? What letters was that? L's. All right. I believe we called, what were we called from one last night, didn't we? We called from number one. Let's go somewhere else and call from well, out there tonight. Let's call from 50. Who has prayer card number 50? Raise up your hand. Prayer card 50? Is it a, that man? Stand right up over here, sir. Let's call 51. Who has prayer? 51, all right. Who has 52? Prayer card 52. Have you, young lady? Prayer card 53. Would you raise your hand? 53, 54, all right. 54, you, sir. 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. Billy, get some ushers and come over here so you can keep the line straight now, will you? Gene, or some, are you on, you're on the recording? Brother Woods, would you come give us some help or some of you? All right. Now, while they're lining up, let me, get, let me talk to you just a moment. Now, you that have to go for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I wish you'd do it now so you won't disturb. See, each one of you is a soul. And when you begin in contact with the Spirit, let me ask you something. I'll give you a, a letter that was given me. I opened it up, and the woman may be here right now. If she is, I want her to raise her hand. It's, is there a place called... Big Mountain or Kings Mountain or some kind of a place like that? It, what is it? Kings Mountain. Kings Mountain. That's where she's from. I just got the letter. She was down, come to the meeting down at Spindale. She wrote me a letter. She said, Reverend Graham, I was read, read your book and said, what is it? Uh, uh, I read your book and said, I was so amazed that I said, I'm going to write to Brother Branham and having to pray over a prayer cloth if I know where he was at. So I just sent it to Jeffersonville and have him the same because she was crippled and had cancer in the bowels. 
And she said, I just got through reading it. Her husband, I believe, had been a minister or something. And said, and I believe she'd been a teacher, Sunday school teacher or something. And she was lying back resting and thinking, well, I'll just send to Brother Branham and have him to send me anointed cloth to pray, pray on me. Said, I believe the man is telling the truth. And said, the phone ring, and I picked up the phone and said, well, a friend of mine called me and said, you want to go to church tonight? She said, no, dear, I can't go. I'm too tired and weary and said, I'm all crippled up and everything. Said, well, I just thought it up at Spindale or having a meeting. Said, Brother Branham is speaking up there. She said, what? And her, said, her heart began. Said, I was just read his book. Said, come get me. And they brought her in. And she said, and I was in the service. And said, that she just sat down on the front somewhere. And said, all at once, now, I don't know this. I have to, that's her testimony. I haven't run those tapes. You might know it, Jean, if you got the tapes. And said, it, I forget what the woman's name is. I've got the letter. I can bring it tomorrow night if she isn't here now. And said, it. Uh, that she's sitting there and said she began to see the way the Holy Spirit was moving, just exactly like the Bible said, and like my book had said it did. And said she said, Lord, that is truth. That's just the way I read it in the Bible, and that's the way I read it in the book, and here it is right before me. She said, God, I believe, and said she'd no more got that out of her mouth. And said I turned and looked at her. I believe told her who she was or something, and told her who, what had happened to her and how long she'd been crippled and all about it. And said, Now, lady, thus saith the Lord, get up, leave your crutches there, and go on home, you're healed. And she said, Brother Branham, I haven't even got even a symptom of cancer or anything. Said, I'm perfectly normal and well. Is a lady in the meeting, would you raise your hand if she's here? She sent me a handkerchief today for some friend of hers way away that's got some disease or something that wants to be prayed for. All right, how many we got down there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How, where, where's fifty, was it? Fifty to sixty? All right. Have sixty-one, sixty-two, sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-five. Maybe we can get through some more. I, don't, I hate to stop right while I'm getting into uh, praying and anointing strikes. I, uh, I just get out of it. It doesn't matter how many or anything stands. It's just, uh, it's just the idea of how many I can get to. You can watch, Brother Preacher. And if I get a pass these, then I'll let you know, and then you give it. All right. I want to look at the audience here. Each one of you, look to me. We're all strangers to one another, are we? You that's in the prayer line, if you are, raise your hand. Is everybody in here strangers to me? I'm strangers. All right. How many in here doesn't have a prayer card and wants the Lord Jesus to heal you tonight? Raise your hand, soon, anywhere you are. All right. Have faith now. Just believe. That's all you have to do. Have faith. I look this away. Now, in the Bible, for the sake of those who are that was here for your first time, in the Bible, Jesus Christ never never claimed to be a healer. How many of that say amen? amen? He said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. Is that right? Amen. He passed through crippled, afflicted, blind people, wouldn't heal them. Went over and healed a man laying on a pallet because the Father had showed him that. He said so. He knew the man was there. And then in St. John, the 19th chapter, or the 19th verse of the 5th chapter, he said, that very, very I say to you, the Son can't do nothing in Himself till He sees the Father do it first. Amen. How many's read that? Let's see your hands. No. Now, that's enough Scripture to prove it, see. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, couldn't lie. If He was, He wasn't the Son of God. So He said, I do nothing in Myself until the Father shows me by vision first what to do. Verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say unto you, I can do nothing in myself but what I see the Father doing. Is that true? Then he never performed one miracle until the Father showed him. It's by vision. A woman touched his garment one time, got healed. He said, I've never done that. She touched his garment, ran out in the crowd and sat down and stood up, whatever she was. He said, who touched me? She said, I didn't. Nobody said, everybody said, no, not me. He said, somebody touched me now called virtue. And Peter said, the whole crowds are touching you. Well, I say, who touched me? He said, but I got weak. He looked around until he found the woman. And he said, she had a blood issue. He said, thy faith, thy faith has healed thee. Is that right? No, thy faith has saved thee. Well, the same word saved is healed every time in the Bible. The Greek word is sozo. Is that right? Sozo. Physically or spiritually, the same word. Thy faith has saved thee. See? Touched some blind man's eyes. They followed him. Lord, have mercy on us. He didn't have no vision. He just went on. Went in the house. They come to him. Lord, have mercy. He touched their eyes and said, Now, according to your faith, be it unto you. No vision. See? 
just as the Father showed him. All right. Now, if Jesus will arise here tonight, I claim that he's the same. He said, these things that I do shall you also. Is that right? Greater, the word really is a try translation, not greater, but more. You couldn't do greater in quality. He healed the sick, raised the dead, stopped nature, done everything. See? So you couldn't do nothing but in quantity. More than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. A little while, and the world won't see any more. Yet you shall see me, for I will be with you, in you, to the end of the world. Now, if he's raised from the dead, he's got to act the same way, the same God, the same person, the same power, the same visions, everything just exactly like he did the first time. If he didn't, well, then his words are wrong. That's a statement. Where would you find in the world today? But Christ is obligated to his word. He's got to keep his word. He kept it with Abraham. He's got to keep it with Abraham's seed. He's got to do it. He has to present it. Then it's whatever you think about it determines what you get. But he's obligated to at least one time present it to you so that you'll be without an excuse at that day. Oh, I feel in my heart, wait till sometime God sends me to Palestine. The Jews look for that. <laughs> well, they read the New Testament. Then they come up out of Aram. They begin to read it. They said, you mean Messiah's been here? Yes, he's dead and raised, raised again. He said, let us, do him, let us see him do the sign of the prophet and we'll believe it. <laughs> I like to see him call him out like this year, a thousand Say, now you accept the Messiah then. And on the same grounds where the Holy Ghost poured out the first time, God will pour it out again on the Jews. Then the Gentiles are finished. You know that. They'll trod the walls of Jerusalem down until the Gentiles be finished. When the Jews get the Holy Ghost and receives the gospel and starts, they'll missionary the world. They'll take it where the Gentiles didn't even think of going. That's right. But just wait. It's your day of grace. Come in while you can. I was within a hundred or two miles of it just recently. I was going right on my ticket up there. And I walked out on the ramp, and the Holy Spirit said, Not yet. Turn this other way and go up towards India. And I did. He, he wouldn't let me go. Well, it's just not seasonable. And someday God will let me do it. I believe it. I want to see it with all my heart. Now, I'm going to ask you all to be reverent, just as reverent as you can. You say, Brother Brown, what are you talking about? You're stalling. I am. Exactly. I'm waiting for that angel of the Lord to come. It's exactly right. I don't know none of you, and I, how could I do anything? I can't. It's him. I can't do it even when he comes unless your faith operates it. It's not me. I can't see visions unless it's your faith that does it. Sure. God's will, by divine gift, only thing I do is just keep yielding myself. And as I get myself completely yielded to the Holy Spirit, then he starts talking. It's not me. He's using my voice. But it's not me. It's him. That's just the scripture exactly. All right. Is this good? Is this the man? All right. I just, yep, I'm waiting for his come. Now, I want you all to just keep your seats. Be a real reverend. Now, at this time, through Jesus Christ's name, I take this group of people under my control for the glory of God. Every spirit in here to be subject to the Holy Spirit. Now, the man who stands before me is a perfect stranger to me. Is that right, sir? We are strangers to each other. Never seen me before. Never seen me before in life. Well, then that's you just heard come. You. you heard of me, but never saw me. Then you just come in here and somebody give you a prayer card either last night or tonight, and here you are. You just have to be. You was the first one called on the platform. Yes, that's right. Tonight, it was given to you tonight, and you was called on the platform tonight. Well, that's mighty fine to get a prayer card the first night and be called to the platform. Must be it's God's will for it then. I don't know. I've known people following for months and months and never get a prayer card to be called. So it just sovereignly works that way. Now, kind sir, you and I are, are, de are probably as born years apart and miles apart in our first time meeting. But yet, if the Holy Spirit of God could tell to me like he did to Christ as the woman at the well, or when he knew where the fish was that had the coin in its mouth, or, or different things like that. How he said to Nathaniel, when Nathaniel was found by Philip and brought him to the Jesus first of his ministry, Nathaniel got saved. And he went and found, or Philip got saved, rather, and went and found Nathaniel, oh, 15 miles or more around the mountains. And he brought him back. He said, come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. So when he come, he walked up in the line like you're standing now by the side of the Lord Jesus. 
And he said to him, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Now, this fellow was a real, was a real Orthodox Jew. He belonged to the Sanhedrin. He was a, belonged to the church. He was everything staunched in religion. So how could this man, Jesus, know that he was a Christian, or a believer, we'd call it, that then, when he could have been a critic or anything else? But how did he know it? And he said to him, Rabbi, our teacher, whence knowest thou me? And Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, 15 miles away, I saw you when you were under the tree. The Jews turned around and said, That's the devil. That's Beelzebub. He's the chief of the fortune tellers. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost has come and does the same thing and you say that, it will never be forgiven in this world or world to come. Because he predicted the Holy Ghost to do the same thing he did. And he is the Holy Ghost. Christ in spiritual form. But what did this believer say? He said, Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. Now, if he's raised from the dead, he's, he's obligated to his word if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? And that's why I'm carrying this conversation with you. The man standing here with his eyes closed. But I'm carrying the conversation. Why? Contacting his spirit. Exactly like Jesus did the woman at the well, uh, other places, and so forth. Right. Now, if the Lord Jesus will let me know what your trouble is, Will you believe that it's him standing here and not your brother? You believe it's Jesus that's telling that? Will that be your attitude towards him? If it would, would you raise your hand? Yes, all right, sir. Be. All right, it would be. Now, may the Lord grant it. Will the rest of you believe with all your heart everywhere? Amen. I get all the doubt away from you. More doubt you get combed out, greater God can work with you. Remember, it is not me. It's Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit that you're now. I believe that he will let me know this man's trouble is the same as he let Christ know the woman's trouble that was standing at the well. Now, the man can be judged of that. I, if he knows what was in his life, surely he'd know what was in the future. So he would know how to do. Now, I now believe that Christ, the Son of God, that we are becoming yielded to his Spirit. And the man is aware that something is going on. It started right then with him, because standing between me and him stands that light, the Holy Spirit, the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. He's conscious of it. If that's right, sir, raise up your hand. That's right. The man's suffering with an extreme nervousness. He's all shook up and bothered about something. That's right. And he's suffering with a heart condition. That is true. He's got a rupture. That is true. That's true. That's right. Raise up your hand, sir. You believe? Jesus. Now look here at me just a minute, sir. You know whether that was true or not. That's true, isn't it? That's true. Exactly. That's true. You believe me to be his servant? Just a man, your brother, yielded to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me tell you something else. I see something happen. The man, I see him fall or fall backwards. He's just had a heart attack. And that heart attack come when it was hot weather. Amen. It's been about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, through the winter, eight, nine. It was about last August. About It was hot weather. You had a heart attack about nine months ago, something like that. And you're scared to death now that it's going to come back again. And because you got a nervous heart. And brother, don't you believe that? That'll bring it on you. Refuse to believe that lie of the devil. When a man has a heart attack, he's stronger than he was at the first place. You believe with all your heart? I believe. Then go rejoicing and praising God and be over your trouble. Now go and be happy and rejoice. Let's say thanks be to God. Nobody will ever know the life that takes out of a person. I can't tell you right now, there's something about a man, I see him laying out somewhere and I'm doing something to him. It's the only thing I can remember right now. It's another world. Now, I want you to be real reverent. Watch this way. Believe. Don't believe me. Believe him. Believe him. Ask him. Say, Lord, if that's true, you people out there that won't be called in the prayer line, Say, Lord, I'm not asking if it's true. I believe it's true. And if you'll just speak to me, it'll make me a great believer. Just do that one time. Now, the lady here, 
I guess we're strangers to each other, lady. I never saw you in my life, but God knows you. I don't. There's a man appeared to the side of the woman. I don't know. Just a moment. Now, lady, I don't know you, and I've never seen you, but one of these days you and I are going to stand in the presence of Jesus Christ when he's in his glorified body and give an account. I want you to believe, and you'll know whether, the, whether these things are true or not. You be the judge. You be the judge. Never seeing you, never knowing you. The first thing I, I know that you're not from around here. You come from somewhere else. Amen. That's right. You come from the south coming this way. Right. Amen. Down about Mississippi, down in the Southlands. And, and you're bothered with a, a disturbance. It's a mental disturbance. It's an oppression. And you're the wife of a minister. And your husband has got the same thing. And what's caused you to be this way is because of your husband. That's right. Amen. And you're having family trouble, yes. up, right, ready for a divorce. Yes. And your husband is uh, kind of possessed. He's let Satan come in and take him over. Amen. That's the right. Do you believe now? Amen. Is that true? Well, go on your road back rejoicing and be happy. And may the evil spirit go out and never bother again through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have faith. Don't doubt. Unbelief is sin. Unpardonable sin. Just believe. That's all he wants you to do. All right. I can just see him coming down. And the disciples standing there. They could they had power, but they didn't have faith to use it. How true that is with this group of people tonight. Jesus, ten days before, had given power to heal the sick and raise the dead. And here there was on an epileptic case, and it failed. They couldn't do it. This father and said, Lord, I brought my son to your disciples, and they couldn't do nothing for him. He said, can you help him? He said, I can if you believe, but it's up to you to believe. So when the devil is gone from the boy... The disciple said, why couldn't we do it? He said, because we are unbelief. Not a lack of power. This church has power enough tonight right in here, this group of people, to do anything. But you haven't got faith enough to do it. You won't, just won't do it. You have faith enough to walk, sir. You have power enough if you had faith. You have power enough too, lady, in the pot. If you believe. But that's up to you, you see. The finished work, I couldn't do nothing. If Christ was standing right here with this suit on, he couldn't do nothing for you. He's already done it. It's already finished at Calvary. See? He asked you, don't you believe that I did it then? Yes, Lord. Say, so then according to your faith, believe it. Act on it. That's all he can do. He can't. If you're redeemed, if something's in a pawn shop and you've redeemed it and got a receipt for it, how can you redeem it again? It's already paid for now, this young lady standing here, I suppose we're being strange to each other. God in heaven knows our hearts. But I, I don't know you. And as far as I know, I've never seen you in my life. But God knows us both. He knows all about us. Now, like the woman at the well, a very picture tonight again. Here, a woman and a man. Now, Jesus went in and sat down against the well, and the woman come out to get some water. He began to talk to her. He said, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask Samaritans such. She said, well, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Now, I'll give you water you don't come here to draw. She said, well, well, it's deep. You haven't got nothing to draw with. And the conversation went on and on and on. That's while he found where her trouble was. He said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have any. So that's right, she got five. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She said, We know that when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things, all things. But who are you? She said, I'm he. That was the sign of the Messiah. Now here we are after 1900 and something years. Again tonight, here stands man and woman. 
Now, he said, I do nothing until the Father shows me. The things that I do show you also. Here's the man and woman, the Bible in here, God's promise, the Holy Ghost here. Now, what's he going to do about it? He's got to keep his word, lady. He has. And if I'm an honest man in my heart, I'll tell you that everything you have need of, for you are a Christian, your spirit feels welcome, and I know you're a Christian. Everything that you have need of was purchased at Calvary. The only thing that I can do is just to maybe be as a, as a prophet, or uh, I don't like to say that name, uh, as being able to see visions. See, that staggers people. It's too much reason I say that. See? They don't understand. Thank you. You believe that, then you can receive. God bless you. The first thing I say, see to the woman, she's got sinus trouble. It's a bothering her. It's exactly right. It's a headache like and across the year. Sinus. It bothers her. And I see your son kneeling, praying. It's in a room. I hear you what you're saying. You're asking a worthy thing. You're asking God to give you a child, a baby. You're a barren and asking God to give you a baby. That's right. God bless you. I have never seen him fail on one yet. A woman in Chicago, 50-something years old, come and ask for a baby. She's got a fine boy. May God grant it to you. Seems to me like I see like swamps or something. Oh, where's this country? A lot of cedar. Look like swamp willow and it's kind of passing. Looks like Arkansas to me. Did you ever in Arkansas? It seems to me like it was Arkansas. It is Arkansas. It's Jonesboro, Arkansas. And the blessed old Bible Hour Tabernacle. Where are you from? You're down there and you're trying to contact me. somebody else in here that's, that's trying to make a contact. It's an aged woman is standing, and they're from a rolling country, maybe Missouri. And that's your mother. It here it goes. There's a, there she sits right there. And she's got heart of the arteries. That's right. Exactly the truth. Amen. Go believe in you. May the God of heaven give you the desire of your heart, my sister, through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. All things are possible to him that believeth. Do you believe? Yes. Little lady sitting on the end of the seat there. You're bothered with a nervous condition, isn't it? got real weary spells comes on you. Don't fear. It's gone from you. Have faith in God. <laughs> Thou canst believe, you know, the Bible said all things are possible. Isn't that true? All things are possible. <laughs> what about you sitting there at prostrate trouble? Sitting right here, the man looking down across the balcony, right here, the elderly man. Prostrate trouble, getting up at night. You believe, sir? Raise up your hand, stand right up here. That's it. You believe, sir? White shirt on, Sam. All right? It's finished. You're healed. Have you got a prayer card? You don't have a prayer. You don't need one. You're healed, sir. It won't bother you anymore. Your faith made you whole. Amen. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. If you believe, no matter where you're at, have faith. All right, we're strange to one another, ladies. I don't know, you never seen him alive. But God does know you, doesn't he? And if God will speak, if I can yield myself to his spirit. Something happened, I don't know what. Would you believe me then? As his servant. You have a different type of nervousness. The lady sitting there with the little paper in her hand. You got a nervous condition too. But yours is a weary type of nervousness. You're mentally upset all the time. And, and this seems like a, you get gloomy and weary feeling, isn't it? That's right. And many times 
you get real weak before your day's work is done. You have to sit down. Your strength is depleted. Isn't that right? Sometimes you get so weary, you walk over to the window, and I see you pull back the window, walk back and forth, and the sun's shining down on the side. Makes you have a real gloomy, weary feeling. Isn't that right? That's right. Raise up your hand. That's right. See? see? I'm not reading your mind, but sister, it's over. Your faith has touched me. Now. now you go be real happy. This lady, Satan lied to you. I've seen a dark shadow come to you. He said, you just go to lose your mind. You see? Go crazy. He said that to you. That's right, right? He suggested suicide and everything else. But it didn't do a bit of good. He, God's healed you. That's right. You're going home now to be well. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe. I'm sorry. I, it, it just as it moves, I have to go with it. You see, it, 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 it's their faith that's doing it, you see. It's, uh, I didn't mean to leave you. I, I, that's just, I just, it just as he moves, I just have to talk quickly, you know, because it's just coming like one great draw from the audience. And as soon as I feel it single out, then I have to watch it, you see, see where it goes to, to find out just the... Uh... <laughs> there it goes again. <laughs> the lady with glasses on here, she stands right here before me. And there she is. <laughs> Amen. Viruses, isn't it, sister? <laughs> right there. That's right. Got a virus, isn't that right? They don't even know what to call it. That's just an excuse the doctor gave you. That's all. But don't you know good now? It's over. You can go ahead and be well. Your faith made you well. A lot of faith sitting in the corner there. What's the matter, people? Start believing. Mm. I don't know those people. I've never seen them. I don't know you. But I challenge you in Christ's name to believe the Bible is true and Jesus raised from the dead. Forget about those church creeds and things and serve the Lord. Believe on Him. He's raised from the dead. You've served Him in a measure. That's right. But my dear friend, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises a standard against it. You're reading these magazines and things how Satan is on a rampage. Yes, sir. God's raising a standard against it. Don't worry. He's always... In the, he's always... On the right side, he's always above the enemy all the time. Do you believe that lady sitting right there? Yeah. Had more faith than you thought you had. See? Faith is a subconscious thing, lady. Faith is not a mental act. See? It's something that you subconsciously do it. People try to look to their intellects for faith when faith doesn't lay in here. Reasons lay here. Faith lays in the soul. Now, the trouble with your foot laying, you believe that Jesus Christ make you well? You do? You accept it? Believe it? Had a little arthritis too. But Jesus Christ make you well. You believe it? All right. And you can have it. Amen. Amen. She just kind of had to come to herself for the angel of the Lord was standing over her. Amen. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. You're bothered, aren't you, lady? You're worried about something. It's your side. You're having numb spells like in it. That's right, isn't it? it surely is. Uh -huh. And you're afraid it's gallbladder trouble causing it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But listen. What it is, really, you've got a growth on the spine. Isn't that right? That's what's cutting the nerve off. It isn't the gallbladder. It's mistaken on that. It's that growth in your spine pinching the nerve. That's what's causing your numbness. You have a gallbladder trouble, that isn't causing numbness. That's true, isn't it? I go and be well. Jesus Christ. Everyone reverent. Be reverent as you can be. Have faith. Oh, you're praying, Mother. I'm trying my best. I can't do it. It takes you to do it. If you believe for him, all right. Wish I could. If I could, I'd heal everybody. But healing doesn't lay in me. It lays in Calvary. Hmm? 
you believe God will heal you that rupture in mother sitting there with a little check address on you were praying saying Lord Jesus let this be my night is that right little mother sitting right there that's right uh -huh. that's right amen have faith in God believe him I wish you'd lay your hands on that lady next to you because she's got flea bite that's bothering her bad and she oh Lord I pray that the Lord Jesus that you will heal her and make her well pray in it amen Mother, be that you did that, the lady with her hands on the lady, turn your hand right back around and catch the lady sitting right behind you. She's got trouble in her side. She wants to be healed too. <laughs> Amen. Father, I pray that you will heal her and make her well also, Lord. Grant it for your glory through Jesus Christ's name. They're kind of a little dark body. You believe that Jesus would cure you of that lung trouble? Believe that he'd make you well? You do? Do you accept it now that he heals you? But, all right. And you can have it. And you with your hand laying up on your head, sir. You believe with all your heart? Uh -huh. you, got your, you put your hand on the lady? That's good. You got, a, you got a cough and a back trouble that's bothering you, but you believe Jesus Christ to make you well? If you can, you can receive what you ask for. All right. She didn't mean to do it. She, she thought I was talking to her. But you've got to throw in this man. Bow your heads, everybody. See, I don't know how bad it is. Just keep your heads bowed and don't nobody look up till you hear my voice. Please. She's hearing. Uh, everyone, just be real ready. He also has kidney trouble. Or the right Dear Heavenly Father, we don't need to see miracles, but that the world might know that you still perform miracles. We ask sovereignly, Lord, and he, feeling this deafness vibrate against me, knowing that he's come to challenge. But Lord, you'll meet his challenge, for you sent Jesus Christ, and he robbed Satan of every power he had at Calvary. And Satan has did this, that the man could walk before a vehicle somewhere and be killed and fill a premature grave. But God, you're here to take it off of him. Then Satan, in Jesus Christ's name, come out of the man. Every head bowed. All right, you You had arthritis, too. You had a kidney trouble, too. Now, raise your head. Feel all right now? How long has the uh, death spirit been on you? Mm. Heart? Years. 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 Uh, what? You hear me all right? Oh, okay. hear me all right? I'm just barely whispering. What? What? They can't even hear me on the mic. Watch her. You can't hear me. Hear me all right? Hear me all right? Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, there's a light around you. Something must have happened in the line. Oh, you were, you've been healed. You had cancer and was healed. And you're standing here for somebody else. That's, right. That's a relative of yours. That's right. It's a nephew. That's right. And it's got cancer or something on the face. That's right. That's right. Then that handkerchief you got in your pocket for him, take it on to him. Put it on him in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Let us say praise the Lord. Do you believe? Believe it, the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the seed of Abraham you are, if you believe right now, I don't care where you are or what condition you're in, Christ has healed you. Do you believe it? Then let us pray. Heavenly Father, only the devil would try to gloom these people into unbelief, but I challenge him. On the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, you are defeated. Christ defeated you at Calvary. You are exposed here tonight by the Holy Ghost, and you're in the form of demon, cancer, deafness, dumbness, cripples, and all other diseases. You did this to the people, and Jesus Christ died to set them free. Come out of them. You can't hold them any longer. I challenge you.